35th Anniversary Pinball Expo. Super Canasta from Quetzal Pinball revealed. Celts from Haggis Pinball also revealed. Hi, my name is Jonathan Houston. I'm the editor of Pinball Magazine, and with me is... Martin Ebb, I'm the editor of Pinball News, and welcome to our monthly recap of all the happenings in the wonderful world of pinball, and this time we're looking back at the month of October 2019. Right, and it's been quite an interesting month. It certainly has. Um, Dominated largely for us, I know, by uh, the Pinball Expo show in Chicago, where there was an awful lot happening. But there was a certain number of things happening before and after that. And we're going to look at all of those in this uh, in this recap. Right. So, um, to start off with uh, uh, Pinball Expo, first of all, congratulations to uh, Mr. Rob Burke, the organizer of the show, for the 35th edition and um i think uh, i have to applaud him for this edition because it was a very good show um i've heard people say it was probably the best expo in at least the last 10 years um and i wouldn't know uh if they if older ones were better because i didn't attend any of those um but it was a very impressive uh, expo i have to say it was i agree um and that was that is no, in, I wouldn't say in, in part, it's almost in, in its entirety due to the, the, the great team who are working on the show. It's not just a one-man operation, of course. Of course. Rob, Rob um, and Bridget together um, do a huge amount to, to bring the show together. But there's so many other people, um, I couldn't even begin to name them, because if you name one, then you'll just... You'll you'll leave leave other people out, but working um, in the in the game hall, the vendor hall, the tournaments, um, working on all the seminars, working in the setting up the all the uh, the, the Stern Pin Lounge, um, and the the uh, the Horror House event and um, the exhibition of pinball history. There's just it just goes on and on and on. Everything about the show it just got bigger and bigger this year and it uh, it really is um bursting at the seams of that hotel they, they need more space and, and there's no more space really they, they can do they can they can use in it, in it because um, unless they start expanding into you no know, non-conference areas which is you know it's a possibility but it's going to be difficult and pricey i'm sure right um, that that show is um has probably got as big as it possibly can do while it's at that venue right so um yeah, and um, so what I understood was that um, the vendor hall, uh, vendor hall was completely maxed out with uh, vendors, something that never happened before, uh, which is a good thing. It's also a sign of uh, how uh, the hobby, or at least, or the industry, if you want to call it that, uh, is uh, flourishing, I would probably say. Um, although I uh, also did hear some vendors complain that um, they were not quite happy with the way uh, the whole Stern Pinball uh, Lounge was uh, organized in the sense that it took a lot of people out of the vendor hall uh, to stick around in the, the, the Stern room, basically, um, resulting in not as many sales as they were hoping uh, for but okay so there's always people complaining about something um, and obviously everybody's free to go where they want to go um, but still okay I can understand that not everybody might have been pleased with um, uh, all the people being drawn to one area of the show um, instead of them uh, walking around I, I'd heard the same same uh, issues being raised. Um, I think some of the vendors were, were less than happy with the uh, the level of business they were doing, but uh, that may have ch- that was up until uh, Friday. That may have changed a bit on Saturday. I don't know, but uh, that is always going to be a danger when there's so much else going on around the vendor hall and not actually within it. People are going to be drawn away, and. Um, if, if all the, the new Stern games, or nearly all the new Stern games, are in a completely separate room, yeah, they're not going to be, uh, people aren't going to be in the vendor hall. And that, that isn't, of course, how it used to be, because Stern's uh, or Marco used to have a big display in the vendor hall. And, and, all, and uh, you have to give credit to the organizers there, then that with all that space being taken out, 
that was, they managed to fill it all with other vendors. Right. So, so there was no there was no gap as a result of that. Um, but yeah, it did mean that the people were if they wanted to play the new Stone games, they would go into into the pin lounge, as it was called, which was uh, next door, and spend all their time in there and uh, and not spend not be wandering around um, looking to buy things in the vendor hall. Right. So um, uh, aside from that, I did not hear uh, that many complaints, or actually none. Uh, mostly that people were really impressed with the show and that everybody was happy. Or, um... Absolutely, I think it, I think it was it was as you said it was the, the best show for years, and that's due to the, the sheer amount of time and effort put into the planning of it. And uh, yeah, that, that was clear. And there was, a, and there was a huge number of volunteers. They made some ch- some very subtle changes, you know, like moving the the entrance to the vendor hall round to the front, moving the tournaments into their own little area. Um, in in a separate room rather than being in the, in the corridor, and uh, that that area was then available for other other companies you know, like um, TNT and um, Scorbit as well to be out there, right, showing their wares. Um, so uh, yeah, I think that 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 rearrangement worked well. Right. Um, uh, speaking of the tournaments, I understand you had quite a long day on Sunday waiting for the tournaments to finish. <laughs> yes, um, so Sunday was supposed to be um, just the the classic, say just, but uh, the the classic tournament playoff. Uh, but also, it uh, ended up including the final of the A division, which was held over from uh, from Saturday night because because of the way the the room was, rooms were set up. And I was saying before about how they're kind of at maximum space now. Some of the rooms had to be sort of like dual purpose or repurposed. For instance, uh, the seminar room had to be pretty much shut down and and all the chairs cleared away so they could hold the autograph session in there on a Saturday, on a Saturday afternoon and then put back again for seminars. Uh, the same kind of thing happened with uh, the tournaments. The tournaments were in the back half of of the uh, Botanic Garden Ballroom, I think is the name of the room, right. uh, while the pin lounge was in the front, well, front half, front two-thirds, maybe, of, of that, that room. And um, on Saturday night uh, at 11 o'clock, they had a kind of end-of-show party there, which uh, was a ticketed event, and that was due to start at 11, and that uh, involved a lot of very loud music, a lot of dance music, and... Um, and the games were opened up for everyone to play, including the tournament games, and uh, which meant the tournament games had to be finished by eleven o'clock. But they weren't, so they were um, they were a few minutes late, and they they didn't get the final of the A division done. So that that carried on to Sunday morning. Right. So that took place, and then the classics went on as well. And um, one game in particular, uh, I think it was Car Hop, uh, was a very long playing game uh, for the classics, and uh, that that delayed things somewhat. And we didn't get out of there until uh, about six fifteen. That's when the when the, uh, the final was decided. I thought it'd be away by about you no know, four o'clock or something like that. But there we go. It's uh, it was fun to watch anyway. It was some good some good games, some entertaining play, and um, congratulations to uh, all the winners in in all the divisions. Um, there was uh, an A and B division in, in the main flip out tournament classics. There was, there was a women's tournament. There was a kids tournament. And there were probably some other ones as well, which I don't know, as well as uh, other tournaments or other competitions that were held, not necessarily at Expo, but for uh, Expo attendees to play in. Right. Okay. So uh, now before we move on, uh, two things I uh, need to uh, uh, comment on. Uh, First of all, uh, for everybody who did not go to Expo, but still want to be in on uh, the seminars that were held at Expo, you did an amazing job as always, but even this year, bigger than before, with video recordings of all seminars, almost all seminars, I have to say, um, which are available on your website, pinballnews.com. Thank you very much for uh, yeah reminding everyone about that. Yes, indeed. Um, 30 seminars on there, as well as uh, videos of uh, walking through the, the vendor hall, the game halls, and other places. Um, so, yeah, I, was, uh, I spent pretty much um, two and a half days sitting in the vendor hall, sorry, in the, in the uh, seminar hall, uh, with a laptop, sound mixer, um, three cameras, and... Um, a couple of laptops uh, recording all this stuff and writing the report as it was going on. So I actually didn't get to see very much of Expo at all. Um, I was only free for about an hour each evening from about 11 till midnight. 
Oh. Um, yeah, when I got a chance okay. to go and get some dinner. Um, but on the plus side, you know, there's, uh, there's 30 lovely seminars there for you to uh, to watch and listen to. And um, I will also also plan, anyway, um, over the next couple of days just to uh, run those through and produce MP3s of them, too. So for those people who only want to listen to the audio you know, uh, rather than watch them, then they can do that as well. So uh, check the website for that. Uh, and thank you for thank you for bringing that up. Right. So, and the other thing I want to point out is that uh, you and I both talked to uh, organizer Rob Burke on the uh, Sunday afternoon of Expo um, when the show basically was over. The tournaments were still going on, but uh, Rob was uh, uh, available and uh, took uh, 15 minutes out of his uh, busy uh, schedule that day. Uh, to talk to us about how he experienced Expo and his plans for the future and so on. And um, we'll be inserting that uh, or playing that uh, uh, interview uh, later on in this uh, podcast. We'll first cover all the news from various manufacturers that has been uh, that that ties in with pinball expo and after that uh, we do the uh, interview with rob burke and then we continue with the news from manufacturers that doesn't tie in with pinball expo yeah sounds like a plan to me okay right so so where should we start i'll start with our headlines then yes well uh, um to uh, I, I'd say to uh, uh, surprise of many, um, two new games were actually revealed at um, Expo. One that I absolutely did not uh, see coming, um, <laughs> and one that was announced, but everybody was like, "Well, we'll still have to see whether that will happen or not." <laughs> um, but but that's it did. Thought, yeah. It, well, it was there. It but it was not the container load that was promised. Okay. So, <laughs> but okay. But <laughs> well, let's let's get to that. Yeah. Yeah. Let's get to this first. Let's start with um, Super Canasta by um, uh, Quetzal Pinball. Yeah, that was a surprise. Um, I mean, I knew Antonio was working on another game after. Tokyo Perfect Drift, which was uh, which we did know about, although I don't think many people have actually seen it in in you know for real. They don't ever seen pictures of it or uh, the flyer, right? Uh, but that game was there as well, Tokyo Perfect Drift, uh, right. and we'll we'll get onto that in a minute. But um, yes, yeah, Super Canasta, a uh, a reworking, or, or, well maybe that's not not even fair. It's a it's a, a totally new game, but with the same kind of title as a very popular Spanish title called um, based on um, Canasta 86 yes. which, which sold very well and did very well for operators in, in the Spanish market a, a basketball game Canasta being Spanish for basket or hoop right and um, it, the, the original 86 version was a, and I, I really shouldn't call it original because it, it's got nothing really to do with the with the new one, but uh, other than the name, but that was a, a very simple single level game, um, and maybe that was why it's very successful. I don't know. It was, it was very simple to understand and uh, difficult to master game, but the new one um, has, has a lot more bells and whistles on it, as you would expect in in today's market. Right. Uh, has um, has a couple of stainless steel ramps. Um, it, it keeps the basketball. Uh, well, in fact, the the eighty six uh, canasta didn't have a basketball uh, hoop, um, but this this one does. It's more like the um, I want to say um, Space Jam version or NBA type. It's a backboard with a magnet which can grab the ball and drop it into the, the into the basket. Right. Um. How that will survive? The problem has always been with those with those back panels having a grab magnet. Is after a while the ball keeps slamming into it, and it, it sort of beats up the magnet, and it flattens out and gets dented and and damages the ball as well. But we'll see how that goes with um, with the Super Canasta game. But it, right. uh, it it looked great. I thought. What what, what, what were your impressions? It was a very colourful game. Um, with uh, well. Uh, uh, for a first showing, I was uh, actually impressed. The artwork looked uh, looked, looked looked very good, I'd say. Um, obviously, there was no reference in in, in like it's a, uh, it's not a license, so you 
can compare it to like what a character is supposed to look like but it looked mm-hmm. like a fun game um, uh, to flip and what's also interesting to notice is that um, I think if I'm uh, and you might have to correct me on this one because I didn't sit in on the seminar um, but um, the game is actually designed by uh, Antonio Arturo of uh, Quetzal Pinball mm-hmm. but he did it for a, a, a larger company and that larger company is actually going to take it into production um, so that's not something that Antonio has to worry about. Yeah, that's um, that almost mirrors the um, Tokyo Perfect Drift game, which was built or uh, was designed for uh, STR Pinball. Uh, but um, Canasta, uh, the uh, Super Canasta, is actually built for a company called Bitronic, who builds slot machines and, and other types of coin-op equipment uh, in their factory in Mercia in Spain. And they, uh, they're looking for a pinball to add to their range, so they, they contracted or contacted and contracted Antonio to uh, to uh, to b- do design and um, and do all the uh, the uh, or arrange for all the artwork and the and the graphics and um, and the sounds and everything to be uh, to be uh, done, so that so they can then manufacture it. So yes, absolutely right. It's it's uh, he doesn't have to build it himself. Right, and um, uh, supposedly this is going to be quite a production run. Um, at least with a big company behind it, you might expect it. Uh, they're not going to build like a dozen games and that's it. No, I hope not. No, they are a well-established um, coin-op manufacturer and, and seller, so they, I'm sure they know the market and, and know how many they can uh, they can sell. Right. So, uh, um, I played a couple of games on it. Um, in all fairness, it was rather late. I don't remember exactly. Um, uh, I remember it flipped well, um, but in terms of gameplay, that's about all that I remember. So, um, okay, um, it, it it does have an LCD um, in the back box, doesn't it? Um, I don't think there's, there isn't one in the playfield, but there is. Um, there is a panel in the back box, much like um, Nemo and um, no, the Captain Nemo, which was uh, the first Quetzal game. Right. So, and uh, of course, the Tokyo Perfect Rift game was also there. Um, you got to play, uh, you got to play it, and to break it as well. <laughs> <laughs> yes. yes, unfortunately, I didn't. Get, that again was late at night after all the seminars had finished. Uh, I did, I did pop in and uh, quickly had a. Uh, a quick game on uh, on, on uh, Tokyo Perfect Drift, but unfortunately, uh, I, I guess it had been a long day by that stage. But I managed to uh, to blow one of the fuses in the in the back box, so uh, that was the end of that for a while. And uh, uh, after that, I had to go back to the seminar room and uh, and carry on working yeah. in there. So, um, but again, you know, from what I what I flipped, which was you know probably thirty seconds worth. Um, it seemed like a, a, a very fun and, and a very, well, a beautiful looking game, actually. I think the artwork on it was great and uh, totally in keeping with the theme. But I'd like to have, like to have uh, experienced it a lot more and uh, hopefully get the chance too soon. Right. So um, while we're on the subject of uh, the uh, closing of the uh, Defender Night at Expo, um, uh, the only downside, I would say, um, I noticed that some vendors were already packing up like around 8.30 on Saturday evening uh, while the show was supposed to uh, last until 10 o'clock. Mm. Um, sure, I can understand that if you have a long drive to go uh, that you want to uh, start packing up earlier, but that's the whole reason why they didn't include a Sunday so that you have the Sunday to drive home. <laughs> Well, that's right, and and there is a there's an official two hour um, packing up time on Saturday night from ten until midnight for vendors, uh, those who want to get away. Now, maybe maybe they can't, maybe that encouraged people to think, oh, I don't need to stay Saturday night, so I can I can pack up and get be out of there by midnight. But of course, if you it takes you long, longer than two hours to do that, then you need to start earlier. So I'm I'm not sure I'm not sure how well that worked out. It's it's good in theory, but if you've got a complex stand, something you can't te- uh, tear down and put in the car and, and be out of there by, or be out of the hall anyway, by midnight, then um, it encourages you to to start doing that process earlier, doesn't it? No. Okay. So, oh well, um, that was just a side note. Um, then um, moving on to that other new game that was revealed at Expo and um, 
we're talking about Haggis Pinball's Celt. Yeah. Um, now, we'd seen something from, from Haggis Pinball. I don't want to say it was a, a, a prototype, even, or, or even a concept game um, at the Texas show. A Texas Pinball Festival in March. Yeah, well, what we saw was a, uh, a blank white wood with a, a bunch of targets and some metal pieces. And, um, well, well, that was about it. And there was a, a, a section where a display would go in the in the play field. But other than that, you could, would not be able to tell whether what to expect, so to speak. No, and, and if that was the, the, the true state of the game in, at that point, then over the next, uh, what would that be, seven months, I think they've, uh, they've come on in leaps and bounds and, uh, and really really put a lot of work into developing the, uh, their, their Celt game and making it into something that actually looks like a, almost a finished product, something that, that's almost sellable. Um, I again, no, I I wasn't spending much time in the, in the in the vendor hall. But did you get a chance to have a, a look at, at the game at all? No, not at all. Um, <laughs> it, it's a pity. Um, I, um, I did walk by it, and I figured like I'll come back to take pictures of this later on. And when I came back, the playfield was already removed, and the cabinet was being shipped um, uh, somewhere else. Um, so uh, I didn't even get to take pictures of it. Okay, well, I, I did quickly. Um, I got a, um, it's on the video that I did of walking around the vendor hall, but also I, I, did, I got some pictures of the play field, the cabinet sides, the, the, the back panel, um, the, and, the, and the back box sides, so you, you can see... Um, see what the game looks like, and um, even if you can, can get a chance to play, I didn't get a chance to play because I wasn't wasn't there for long enough. But uh, um, it seemed to be a steady line of people, and I never saw the game actually have any issues. That's not to say it didn't, but um, and, and of course I wasn't in there very often. But um, I didn't hear anybody um, complaining about that. In fact, I didn't actually hear any comments about it at all, to be honest. And I'm sure if it, if it had been problematic or somebody had said, "Oh, that's a, that's a heap of junk." Um, they would have said that if they, that's what they thought. But uh, so, so uh, I'll, I'll have to put it down as a uh, as a win for uh, for Haggis Pinball. They said they've turned up and uh, and they were um, they were they weren't taking pre orders, but they were asking people to register their interest in buying one, and they set a price point on that at five thousand two hundred and fifty dollars. Right. Uh, so. um, but again, it's interesting. It kind of follows the. I can't say it's a trend, but um, it, we've certainly seen it a few times in the past of, of simpler play fields. It's a single level. It's got no ramps. Um, it's got um, some drop targets, a three-flipper game, a couple of scoops, um, rollover lanes, two, two pop bumpers, which is unusual, um, and features a lot of cartoon-style artwork on the uh, on the playfield and cabinet. Um, yeah, and I which, think it tried to capture some humor elements in the artwork yeah. as well. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the artwork style, not the not the humor aspect of it. Artwork um, reminded me a bit of the original Lexi Lightspeed look in in the way that it's done as cartoons, rather than any any attempt to make it um, you know, photorealistic. Right. And um, as you said, it's uh, it's got a playfield. LCD, which is a, a portrait shape one, uh, vertical orientation, and and a back box um, LCD, which um, is is quite large actually. It's about the size of the stern ones, I think. So it's um, now there's a couple of displays there to drive, um, but but even so, quite a simple play field. But it, it looked good from what I saw. Uh, what they've done so far, the graphics. Yeah. Well, it looked good. Um, I read one comment uh, by someone who wasn't that impressed with uh, gameplay. Um, but I figure, okay, that could, uh, rules can be uh, changed and um, uh, uh, the game can improve uh, if after enough test play turns out like, okay, maybe we should change this to that or something like that so mm. i'm not sure whether that will be the case um and i'm on just basing this on one comment that i read online um so i don't want to give it too much attention um but in terms of code okay we will have to see how how much fun the game is but in terms of uh cosmetics it looks uh pretty good 
Yeah, I was impressed by by how far they come you know, since since the Texas show. So, uh, but as I, neither of us played it, and neither of us got much experience of uh, even getting our hands on it, um, we'll uh, probably just leave it there and uh, and congratulate Haggis on uh, on bringing their uh, their Celts game to to Expo. As you said, not not the numbers they were hoping, but, um, but certainly a, a very good sign of the progress they've made. So, uh, congratulations to them. Right, okay, so moving on to Stern Pinball, who was uh, dominating the show in uh, multiple ways, I would probably say. Obviously, there is the uh, the Stern Pinball Expo tour on the uh, Thursday of Pinball mm-hmm. Expo. I didn't get to join because I only flew in Friday uh, afternoon. Um, you were there. I, I didn't get to join the tour. I didn't go on the tour um, because I was not because I was banned, but because uh, I was actually back at uh, the, the hotel. Um, I had to set up all the stuff for the uh, for the seminars, which started at one thirty. So um, and with a whole new rig for the recording and having to do all the PA and microphones and stuff um, and projectors and screens and all that kind of stuff. Um, that takes about four hours to wow. set up um added to the fact we also um people wouldn't know this but oh, it, those who went to the seminar room um when we first got in there uh, about um about nine o'clock the whole room had been set up 90 degrees the other way oh so so all the chairs were well, it was basically the the stage was running down the long wall and all the chairs were in front of it really close and in shallow rows but very wide uh, which was no use at all for our use so um, the whole thing had to be dismantled including the stage it all moved up to the other end of the room all the chairs reset and everything before we could even start setting up so that was fun so it was just as well i didn't try and go on the on the factory tour or we wouldn't have done it but always uh, full of surprises yeah so that's about an hour of rearranging that room and uh, the workers work very fast and they're very efficient in doing it but even so they come into the room and go uh this isn't going to work <laughs> So, <laughs> a, a series of frantic phone calls, and uh, suddenly the place is like a, a beehive with everybody rushing around and uh, doing their bit. And an hour later, the whole thing's set up again, uh, 90 degrees round from where it was originally. Right. But, okay. but no. so, yeah, I didn't do the factory tour, is the, uh, is the gist of that. Uh, but those who did go on it, I think... Um, Thoroughly enjoyed it. I mean, Stern have, have got this off to a fine art by now. They they know exactly what to say, where to show people, uh, the routes to take, the handouts to give people. Gary Stern was there. He was back from his uh, recent travels and uh, welcomed everybody. Uh, but the, the, the factory tour was, was certainly going on for a long time. I think uh, even at, like, um, I think it was meant to start at about, the buses left uh, just after nine o'clock from the hotel. It's about half an hour to get down there. Uh, and uh, by 11 o'clock, people were still joining the queue to uh, to go around the factory. Oh, well, that's normal. Yeah. Yeah. But I think it w- worked well. And they, they certainly had a nice, um, the, their uh, merchandise uh, booth there, selling, you know, all their, their clothing and, uh, and other swag, which people seem to appreciate. And... Uh, I think overall it was a, a big success, and uh, I didn't hear any issues and any complaints. I don't think there's any any um, secrets were uh, were gleaned from uh, what upcoming titles might be. I think uh, they're all uh, all pretty pretty used to uh, making sure there's nothing lying around the factory which might give any clues to anyone. Right. So, uh, the way I understood it, uh, three games were on the production line. Uh, obviously, uh, Elvira, House of Horrors. Um, the Star Wars comic art game, if I'm not mistaken, and I'm trying to think uh, what the other. Oh, and Jurassic Park, Jur- of course. Jurassic Park, I thought. Yeah. Yes. Mm-hmm. So, um, um, yeah, and um, obviously all of uh, th- all of those games, uh, the those three titles were uh, heavily presented um, at the um, Stern Pin Lounge uh, that we mentioned earlier. Um, Elvira in the um, uh, premium uh, no, the, uh, was it the limited or the premium version? I'm not even sure at this point. But there's also um, not much difference in... in no, the play field's the same, so uh, I wouldn't like to say. I, I guess it would be the uh, the the premium 
premium would be the the first one. Right. Although they started. Uh, uh, building the limited edition ones first, uh, because they wanted to ship those and make sure that they those are out for uh, before Halloween. So, oh well. Um, so, th- uh, well, so the Elvira game was heavily presented in the pen launch. Jurassic Park was uh, was there. Uh, a few Star Wars comic art games uh, as well. I've seen uh, Black Knight games. Uh, both the limited and the uh, or the premium and the uh, the pro model uh, Deadpool was there Iron Maiden and uh, Monsters of course so basically all the latest Stern titles were present in the pin lounge and the pin lounge also had a prototype topper for uh, Black Knight yeah that was uh, that was looking good I, I didn't didn't get to see it in action to be honest because uh, the, the only time I was there, um, I was too busy doing other things. But uh, I, I guess the fact you noticed it um, means yeah, that you, so, you so saw, it, saw what it did. Yeah, so the topper is, um, if, if you uh, have in mind the back panel uh, on the play field of Black Knight, it has this uh, uh, sort of uh, gate um, with a fire behind it. Um, that's actually represented on the left and the right side of the topper, and in the center is uh, the head of the Black Knight, um, which is actually moving and lighting up while it's uh, uh, in sync with speech. And uh, so the, the Black Knight is literally from the back box overlooking you playing the game. Right. Okay. And uh, and the movement of the head uh, that was rather uh, rather smooth, I would say. So that looked very nice, very interesting. And um, yeah, that uh, it's nice to see uh, a topper with actually some mechanical action. I mean, we've yeah. seen toppers that that I'm sure there's some blinking lights and uh, um, uh, but but nothing really happening. Uh, but this one actually is very interactive, uh, so um, yeah, that looked very cool, and um, I'm I'm curious how it tested. Obviously, it was a prototype, and um, uh, I um, I saw only one, so I'm not sure whether there were more. But um, I'm curious to see when that will go into production and um, and so on. But so that was interesting, I think. Uh, obviously, uh, in the same. Uh, pin lounge Elvira had her uh, stand where she was doing her autograph sessions well she probably probably say that it's uh, it's Cassandra right um, Cassandra Peterson um, who plays Elvira but she was never never dressed as Elvira she was always herself right in, in all the appearances I, I, I suppose if you want to want to have Elvira there you, you have to uh, it costs extra you, yeah, yeah you have to pay more shall we say um so that didn't happen, but uh, Sandra was uh, was very seemed to be very pleasant throughout and seemed to be enjoying herself at the show. I think. I mean, I hope so. Um, I'm compared to um, the Texas Pinball Festival uh, from 2017. Um, mm-hmm. I'd have to say that uh, I got the impression that the line in Texas was a lot longer for uh, people to have uh, their photo taken or uh, get a, a, a signature from Elvira or Cassandra Peterson. Um, but that being said, even though the line was smaller at Expo, it, there was still a line all the time. So mm. um, I'm not sure whether uh, the length of the line in this case matters but it was something that i did notice um, and and you also have to consider i think i think this is correct that she was actually there for two two separate signing sessions yes one on one on friday and one on saturday right so people had a chance to spread their uh, um, time or whenever mm. they wanted to uh, to go out there um i do have to say that i was slightly disappointed to see that um there was the Elvira seminar um, where um, Elvira basically appeared for 10 minutes as a special guest, or she was announced as a special guest, got inducted into the Pinball Hall of Fame, and 10 minutes later um, she was gone uh, or leaving uh, because after that it would just be technical stuff that would be discussed. And I was like, well, she could stick around and comment on that as well. But apparently she had other plans. So, oh well. 
Yeah, that's. Uh, I, I actually heard originally she wasn't going to be staying for that long. She was just literally going to be turning up, um, just saying a few words and then disappearing. You know, after about a minute. But uh, but she did join the panel, as you'll see in the uh, in the seminar video, and um, spent, as you say, about ten minutes there answering questions about about her role in in this game and previous games, and uh, and the work that she did for it, and uh, and what she thought about about being part of uh, pinball history and in, uh, in having three games uh, based on her character and um, that is an accomplishment we have to agree on that it is and um, obviously driven by dennis and greg and their uh, their, their promotion uh, their, uh, their their love of working with her i guess and um, i think for that for that reason um alone it was uh, it was right that she was inducted into the pinball expo hall of fame um and so she received a plaque for that and and, and soon after that yes yeah, you say she uh, she went off and uh, and the rest of the panel who uh, you know who who also worked on the game could get on and answer some of the more technical aspects of uh, how the game was put together and uh, and and designed really in the first place right so um one thing uh, from that panel, since we're talking about it, that um, actually dawned on me after the panel, and I'm, it's a pity that I didn't realize that uh, during the panel, um, as you may recall, um, a photo was shown of the uh, the, the Nordmanite uh, mm -hmm. uh, version of the playfield that had a, um, a steeper ramp on the left, which had, um, 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 what do you call it, um, two hills in there, so to speak. Oh, right, yeah. Kind um, of like Sanity Falls one on Whitewater. Yes, and that was um, taken out for uh, uh, budget reasons, apparently. Um, although Greg did mention that it was rather difficult to make that ramp, uh, and it caused a lot of balls to uh, to roll back. But if it was just for uh, cost-cutting measures, a, a, a couple of other features were also taken out. And later it dawned on me, like, no, hold on, this is a premium model. The cheapest model is the premium model. Mm, um, right. Why would there be cost-cutting measures? I mean, if you take stuff out for the pro, I get it, because you want to make a cheaper model for, for operators and uh, people who don't want to uh, spend that much money on a game. <coughs> Sorry. But in this case, if you start with the premium model, then you figure you get all the bells and whistles that the designers come up with. Well, obviously, any game is going to have a, a bill of materials that it has to has to stick to, in order to to achieve the the, the either the uh, the target sales price right. and or the and or the uh, the profit margin that they want to make on each game. And I don't think you can necessarily um, directly relate the game what's on the game itself to the cost of the game. If you look at a game like The Beatles, for instance. You know the, the actual what's it's a single level game that it's, it should be relatively cheap to make compared right. to many of the Stern Slater games, but of course the price doesn't doesn't reflect that. So um, even if you add in the cost of the license, the Stern want to keep a certain you no know, prestige to their games. They don't want to sell them off at a cheap price. They don't want to sell a a premium at a pro price. No, I get because, that, but. Obviously, that then, then, then muddies the waters when it comes to uh, different segmentations of the market. Right, but if you're paying a premium price, then you might expect as well that, that, that the cool features that the designer intended to be in the game are actually in the game. Well, of course, you ideally, you would never find out what those features that were taken out were, or in fact, the fact that... The world yeah, well, that's where that. Pinball Magazine comes <laughs> in because we love to report on that kind of stuff. And I'm glad that um, uh, these uh, photos were part of the presentation uh, of the team So uh, because a, a lot of people actually love to see that kind of stuff, um, to see what's in the game or what was supposed to be in the game and what was taken out or how the development of a certain mech went. So, But that sort of dawned on me after uh, the seminar. I was like, well... Oh well, and I might have uh, still uh, not be right, I mean, uh, and sure, apparently there is cost cutting on premium models as well, uh, but it's not something that you'd expect, I mean, at least 
I figured, like, hold on, if you're paying a premium price, then why cost cutting? But okay, it might be me. Anyway, I hope the people that bought the game or are going to buy the game will enjoy it. Mm. And um, to help them enjoy it, there have been um, a couple of code updates in in the past month. Uh, it was released with version zero point eight five code. Eight, uh, eight three. Sorry, 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 eight three. Absolutely right. Yes, uh, eight three was the was the released one. Since then, there's been eight four and eight five is the current one. Right. So, um, uh, which had some add some extra sounds, uh, but I don't think it. Um, it has any Elvira speech, or um, but I know I know from talking to uh, the people at Stern there is more Elvira speech to come in the game, and also there's a lot more stuff to come from uh, Tim Kitzrow, who does the uh, was main commentary of the game, well, and a lot of extra voices in the game as well. Um, so uh, yeah, he's he's doing multiple voices in uh, in the game. And, um, yeah, yeah. And personally, um, uh, I don't want to sound too harsh, but I really hope there will be a lot more humor in the game because that's what I'm sort of, uh, that's how I got to know uh, uh, Elvira um, uh, sort of in the first place, uh, the double entrances and so on. And so far I didn't uh, hear that many jokes or, or double entendres or, or funny stuff uh, mm. uh, so far. I wasn't um, giggling that much when playing the game. Um, I'm not sure. Did you get to play the game during Expo? You, I know you played it after Expo at a, at a local um, arcade. Yeah, I got to play it um, a little bit during Expo, although obviously the games being in the pin lounge, it's very noisy in there. And, uh, and in the evening as there's often music being played. So you've got no chance of hearing anything, but I did get to hear some of it. And I, I found that I, I like the flow of the game. That was the immediate thing that struck me. It was uh, the, the ramps aren't that steep. The ball seemed to be going up ramps that you think it's not rolling fast enough to be able to make, but it, it does. So that's good. Um, what I, what I did, what I was rather disappointed with was the all the intros they had to the, all the various movie modes because they're long, they're very long. Uh, you know, they feel like they're twenty seconds or thirty seconds long, and you really don't care about most of them. And after you've seen them once, you just want to you just want to press both flipper buttons and just get on with the with the mode. So that means there's a huge chunk of the video that is pretty much wasted. So I'm hoping there'll be there'll be more, as you said, there'll be more sort of throwaway lines, little little quips, little uh, double entendres and uh, uh, one-liners in there that'll make you laugh during gameplay rather than all, everything being, you know, let's stop the ball, let's play a video, and then then we get back back into the gameplay. And we don't hear hear from Elvira again until we, the ball stops and we do another mode. Yeah. Um, speaking of stopping the ball, I heard uh, quite a few people complain actually that. Um, during the start of the um, uh, the movie mode, mm -hmm. uh, not every game uh, holds the ball uh, uh, where it's uh, underneath the uh, the house where it's supposed to be, uh, but actually the ball uh, basically got loose and continued uh, gameplay while the playfield was almost completely dark. Uh, yes. So that might be a bug or, or something uh, hardware-wise that um, they might want to uh, to take a look at in in production. Yes, I think that's uh, that's fair, and also of course you, know, you can do it in software. As, as soon as uh, I don't know, don't know if there's a, a sensor on the way into the house, but if that's triggered uh, while the movie's playing or any other playfield switch is triggered a slingshot or whatever, then abandon them, abandon the lighting effects and, and take it back to normal gameplay mode. Right, okay. Now, uh, there's two more uh, Stern-related uh, topics to discuss in the sense that um, we might actually see a new title before the end of the year. Yes. Um, I think we might be seeing something, I, know this, I haven't had this confirmed by anyone at all, but I'm, I've got a sneaking suspicion we might be seeing something from, from Brian Eddy. Um, before the year is out, um, well, about time. Yeah, I know. He's, uh, he's, he was announced as, as I think it was probably even at that, that same uh, Texas seminar in, in twenty seventeen, where Alvaro was at um, all the same same show, 
where it was announced, I think um, I think George Gomez announced that Brian was was working uh, on a game. I think no, I think he said he was actually uh, a senior designer at the company at that point. And yeah, in all that time, we haven't knowingly at least seen anything from him. Right. So I'm um, I'm hoping we might get to see something before the end of the year. I don't know we'll we'll get anything for IAPA in November. I think that's probably a bit too soon. But we might get something uh, you know, before the holidays. Um, so, so uh, you know, maybe in the uh, the London show in right. uh, in January, yeah. uh, EAG International, we might might get a chance to get our hands on on that. Right. So uh, Brian Eddy was uh, at uh, Pinball Expo on uh, I think it was the Saturday, and uh, I got a chance to briefly talk to him. And um, uh, obviously, the most asked question to him during the event was when is your game coming out um he couldn't say anything about it so he didn't uh other than that that was the most asked question to him uh, <laughs> so yeah. oh well so uh so he didn't say anything um but okay let's see um uh, let's wait and see uh, personally i think um uh, an early january announcement would be soon enough um, that they because then they have something out to go to the uh, consumer electronics show, which I think in January, and that's immediately followed by the uh, EAG show in London mm. as well. Yes, good, good call. Cool. Um, the CES show could could well be a good one uh, to launch it. At. Um, it wouldn't be the first time they'd done that, right? So, um, and uh, obviously, speculation is running wild on what Brian Eddy might be working on. And um, mm. uh, since we don't do speculation, we're not getting <laughs> into that. <laughs> so, no, no, let's stick with things which which we know have happened. And we, when we were talking about code updates to Alvaro just now, but uh, Stern have been been bringing out code updates for other games as well. Right. Um, the uh, I suppose the, probably the biggest one has um, has been the Jurassic Park. Uh, update which went from a seemingly minor step of 0.90 to 0.91, but uh, they've added a, you know, a huge amount of extra features and uh, adjusted various scoring opportunities, um, brought in some um, some additional videos and and sounds, and um, and also changed the way some of the options or some of the features in the game work and added other options which weren't there before. So. Uh, there's obviously still a lot of work going in into Jurassic Park, and I think it's uh, I got a chance to have a, a decent play on it. Um, it would have been after the show, actually, when we went to some of the arcades in uh, in Chicago, and in particular at, uh, at Lemmings, is where they just have a couple of, of nice pins, and uh, the Jurassic Park Premium there. And uh, yeah, I'm really starting to enjoy it after after getting to getting some hands on time in a more quiet, relaxed atmosphere. Right. Um, it, I found it confusing to start with, but I think now it's um, having having played it more and watched some of the um, the uh, tutorial videos that have, uh, that have been produced by Stern and by Keith in particular. Um, it's all starting to make a lot more sense, and, uh, and I think he's added all the all the fossil awards now, or him and the and, and the team. So so they're all in the game, and um, I think it's uh, it's it's shaping out to be a, a really nice game. Good. Okay. And um, uh, well, the last thing, sort of tying in with Stern Pinball, although no longer. Um, <laughs> that would be the um, let's call it the split between Christopher Franchi and the Stern Pinball, uh, which um, I'm not sure whether it's a, a, a really big surprise, but obviously Stern Pinball have not been using the services of um, Christopher Franchi since uh, the Monsters. Um, he did go on Canada's Pinball podcast uh, earlier this week where he had an uh, uh, interview of an hour and a half about why he left. And uh, basically, it uh, appears that it comes down to uh, Gary Stern not approving of Christopher Franchi selling uh, licensed artwork at uh, various pinball shows uh, um, out of fear that Stern might get into uh, difficulty with mm. that, with licensors, while um, according to uh, Frenchy, there is an unwritten rule 
uh, for artists that they are sort of allowed to to sell some uh, artwork in low quantities at at events like Comic Con and and what have you, and nobody uh, from the licensing department will care about it or go after them they're just like okay that's a little bonus for they these are official artists that worked on the game and now they're selling off some stuff and fine let them do it so uh, but apparently that was a um, uh, returning uh, um, uh, conflict uh, probably and uh, that resulted ultimately into um, uh, Stern and uh, Christopher Frenchy parting ways um, which um, that do- doesn't mean that uh, we've seen the last of Christopher Frenchy and Pinball. Um, frankly, he's already involved with another company. Mm. Yes. Do you want to tell us about that? Well, uh, that other company appears to be Chicago Gaming, um, who at Pinball Expo revealed a, uh, a gorgeous topper for Medieval Madness. I have to say, and apparently, uh, if I understood it correctly, um, that topper is um, uh, partly designed by Christopher Frenchy. Hmm. Um, not entirely sure which part he did then, because um, there's, there's not a, it's not a huge I, amount of artwork to it. There was there's the model, and there's, there's a back panel, right, to it. Um, so maybe it's maybe it's that, but it, that that looked like it was part of the castle from the. Uh, from the back box or from the translite. Right. Um, it could be that he did some sketches for it, and after those sketches, the model was made. I'm not sure. Um, I tried to get some uh, info on that from uh, Christopher Frenchy, um, but unfortunately, he hasn't gotten back to me. But what I understood is that um, he was involved in the design of a topper in some way, and that topper would be revealed at Expo. Um, and the only topper Chicago Gaming did reveal was that Medieval Madness topper, which makes me conclude mm. that he was sort of involved in that. And if I'm incorrect, then I stand corrected. Okay, because um, well, we, we both went to Chicago Gaming and uh, I, I don't know, um, separately though, and we certainly got to see the original molds for those models that were that are used. On the on the uh, topper, and we saw how they all fitted together, and um, the name of the artist who did it, or who made those. Uh, they were three D printed originally, and then turned into molds. Um, the name of the artist who did that um, was was mooted, and it, I, it, I don't think it was uh, Mr. Franchi who was involved in in the design of those. And then they were they were painted by Matt at Back Alley Creations. So right. he was the one who did the the uh, the painting of the models that were then no at least in the in the prototype form. Well, maybe Chris drew the plastic castle in the back. Uh, I don't know. Um, hmm. Well, well, perhaps we'll get back to you and we'll update everyone with uh, the news on on uh, what Chris did in, in that uh, a little bit later. But uh, there's also there are a few other items of uh, stern news before we move on um, to some of the other companies. Uh, we mentioned earlier that. Um, Cassandra Peterson was inducted into the Pinball Expo Hall of Fame, but right. she wasn't. She wasn't the only inductee this year, um, because also Pat Powers, who's uh, who's in charge of the service department, I think at Stern. Uh, I don't know his exact title, but um, he was inducted as well. So, um, so definitely. Um, the uh, I think it's, it's we can almost officially call it the the Stern Pinball Hall of Fame these right. days because I think everybody who goes into it is is a member of the Stern team one right. way or another. Um, and uh, and also talking of Stern, um, Gary has been uh, been travelling around um, as he does, visiting various trade shows and um, in in countries around the world. And uh, I think I think you spotted him in. Um, in Brazil, is that right, yes, Jonathan? Yes, at the Brazil Game Show. Okay, so he was there. And also, he's been... Um, actually, I'm not sure whether he was in China. I suspect he was. Uh, no, was he China. was in China. Um, yeah. What's rather interesting about that, that show was actually in September. Uh, but on Stern's Facebook, um, they waited about a month before they published those photos. Uh, because that show, I, rem- I, I know that show was in uh, in September, so... It's rather strange that they waited so long uh, polishing these photos. But, indeed, uh, Gary has been traveling. and He was in Europe first and then 
flew to China and uh, well, he's quite a globetrotter. I'm pretty sure yeah. he's, he's making enough uh, uh, miles in the air. <laughs> yeah, uh, that's that's just on business. Uh, he likes to travel as well for uh, for personal um, re- relaxation, but. Um, there was, there's still a couple of extra things. We, 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 there is some, there's more code yet that we didn't uh, didn't yes. mention, uh, and that was for. I mean, last month we had the the, the big news about uh, the major rewrite of, of the Ghostbusters game, right? And and how how the way that game played or that functioned had, had changed radically with a with a new version, which people have been waiting years and years for. Mm-hmm. Um, so there was a lot of uh, a lot of a joy when that finally came out. Well, this this month there were uh, a few little minor tweaks and uh, bug fixes to that release. Um, so there's a new version of the Ghostbusters code came out. Um, if you've uh, installed the new version uh, with all the new um, gameplay, you should definitely get the the tweaks and the and the bug fixes um, installed to uh, to go with that. And then. Um, Although we, we actually mentioned it um, in passing uh, as regards Pinball Expo and, and what was in the uh, Stern Pinball Lounge, um, the, yeah, we, the, this was the month where the, uh, the, the comic art editions of, of Star Wars uh, were announced. We, we haven't actually covered that as a, as, as a specific launch, but um, Star Wars, as you know, was originally based in, uh, when it came out from, from Stern on the first, first batch of movies. Um, but now they've they've brought out comic art versions based on the comic books of the Star Wars universe, um, and they are the two versions of that available a pro and a premium, not a limited edition this time around. I'm guessing they want to want to stick with the the limited edition of the movie version to be the limited edition. Right. Um, I haven't really got anything much more to say about the the comic art editions. Um, I don't know. Have, have you? No, I think uh, the artist was called uh, Randy Martinez. If I, I say that from the top of my head, his last name yeah. might be something well else. Well remembered. I think you're right. I couldn't remember his name myself, but yeah. I yeah. think um, now you've said it, it sounds absolutely right. And um, yeah, he's, uh, he's he, he works for uh, Lucasfilm and he's, uh, he's done comic art for uh, Star Wars uh, before, so... And he was very yeah. happy that uh, that his art got included on a on a pinball machine, so uh, and he got to do two models uh, immediately. So, yeah, I think it uh, it seemed to get a very warm reception from from people who who like the the uh, the comic version of uh, the Star Wars universe. Yeah, and uh, the interesting thing is, um, I recall when Star Wars came out and and and, and people bought the game and played the game. Nobody was actually that impressed with the game, um, and now that there is a comic art version, everybody is like, "Oh, great, great, great! Yeah, it looks a lot better, but the gameplay is still." <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, it's just a uh, it's another means of uh, of selling the game, isn't it? Without uh, without doing too much to, I don't I don't know what else is. I don't think anything has changed as far as the the LCD displays go. I think that's the same, right? And. Um, Obviously, the playfield design hasn't changed at all, although the art the artwork has. So right. it's um, um, it's so a fairly fairly easy win for Stern if they can uh, they can uh, rebrand it effectively in right. that way. It's basically, the new, basically new re- repackaging the same product, but people weren't that impressed with the product in the first place. So it's sort of strange to me that people now all of a sudden are are. Uh, uh, hooraying uh, this this new game because once you start playing it, it's still the same game that people didn't like. But I might be wrong. Um, might be a completely different gameplay experience <laughs> uh, due to the comic art on this game. Yeah, well, you know, it's all a package, isn't it? So if it makes it makes it more enjoyable for people to to be able to look at the art, the comic version of the art, then uh, fair enough. Right. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't suppose anybody's going to sell. Anyway, anybody who owns the game is going to sell it and buy the comic version, but they might, they might pick up a few extra sales for the company. So it's, uh, as I say, fairly easy win for them if, if that works. Right. Um, I, I think that's that's everything. I think from from this month uh, from the uh, Elk Grove Village um, factory. Right. 
Yeah, so, uh, but obviously the industry is bigger than just Stern Pinball. Um, Absolutely. Other manufacturers um, have, uh, there's news on those as well. Um, let's start with um, Jersey Jack Pinball. Um, they revealed their uh, collector's edition of Willy Wonka, and you made quite a list of uh, what's <laughs> in there. Yeah, there's um, so this is um, the collector edition Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory comes with a mirrored back glass, a candy red uh, metalwork or armor, depending on how you want to call it. Right. Um, some interior, some cabinet interior decals. Unusually, it actually comes with some custom game speech by uh, Julie Dawn Cole, who plays plays Ver- Veronica Salt in the movie. Mm-hmm. So that that's just for the collector edition. So that that that's a nice little extra. Um, the shooter rod is a is a sort of looks like the gobstopper that um, spins around in the game. I'm not sure how comfortable that's going to be to hold, but I you don't really use it very much, so uh, I don't think it'll be a problem. But it looks very nice. Right. Um, it also has uh, a different version of of art on the cabinet, and it's on the um, on the super thick glossy rad cowls, which Jersey Jack put on there or make available or uh, put on their, their up uh, top end machines. Right. Uh, it has different playfield art because uh, it has. Well, I guess um, it's, it's sort of the same, but certain colours have sparkle added to it. They do, yeah, yeah. It sort of highlights various areas of the playfield and it's underneath the the clear. Hopefully, um, it also has a topper, which, um, frankly, I thought was a little bit disappointing. It's a colour changing topper. It's a bit like the, you know, the Wizard of Oz type. Um, yeah, uh, like like etched, a, 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 etched um, plastic sheet um, right. that's, that's bottom lit and. Um, it's three dimensional, I think. So it, it does have like the Wonka bar in front, um, so it's layered. But when you compare it to to some of the um, the other well, uh, like toppers the, that are out there, yeah, uh, like the medieval madness one or or uh, the, the, the the black the black white one, one. Yeah, yeah, then then uh, that's a, a world of difference, I'd say. Well, maybe that's. Um, I mean, I don't think that's an area where Jersey Jack has really sort of investigated sales of um, dynamic toppers for certain games so that you can buy as an aftermarket add-on um but but you know other companies are, are looking at that obviously with um um chicago gaming doing their medieval madness and and stern making a making a big thing of toppers but anyway getting back to the list of, of other changes also got um it's got cabinet bottom lighting so it's got lighting strips running underneath the cabinet um to light the floor which you, know, you can obviously buy as aftermarket ones, but these are integrated into software as well. So that's good. I think you have to be careful if you're if somebody who uses like a, a table lift to lift your machines when moving them around. Make sure you don't crush those strips of LEDs. Right. Um, it also comes with an autographed plaque, uh, autographed by Jack, um, Pat Lawler, designer of the game, John Yalsey, artist, uh, and three of the kids from the movies or movie, I should say. Right. Um, and I think that's a full list of uh, what's available in the, in, the, uh, in the collector edition. Yeah, and the good news is, if you're in the market for a collector's edition of uh, Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory, uh, apparently they have not sold out yet, so you can still order one. And they are being made at the moment. They are, being, they are making them, shipping them. They're not going to be making any more limited edition games. For the uh, rest which, of the year. Yes, for the rest of 2019. That's right. Yeah, yeah. So um, they do have games in stock. So if you're in the market for just a, a regular limited edition, then that's still not a problem, and they might be able to ship you a game immediately. Um, but if you want a collector, uh, collector's edition, then uh, that's being built uh, until the end of the year, I think. And um, so the waiting times for those are not that long either. And besides building the games, they've also been working on uh, software updates. So there's been new code, two two versions of code this month from uh, version 1.25 and version 1.26, which have added uh, a new mode, um, more speech, um, more awards for, um, for for random awards, and for when you collect certain numbers of bars. 
and uh, also a number of bug fixes to try and uh, sort out any issues with the game that can be done through uh, through software. Right. So, uh, and and I suppose we would also uh, congratulate uh, Jack Guarneri on uh, his uh, 62nd birthday, a late celebration, because it was on the, the 10th of October, but it falls within our, our remit of looking back at the past month. So, uh, happy birthday, and uh, congratulations, congratulations to Jack. Yes, absolutely. Um, moving on to um, American Pinball, um, Rush uh, Kugler, or, sorry, Josh Kugler, and um, Joe, I forgot his last name. Um, Schober. Yes, they did a seminar at uh, Pinball Expo um, where they talked mostly about uh, Oktoberfest. And the good news is a new code update for Oktoberfest has just been released. It's code uh, 191024. That's a date, in fact. Yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. It was released actually the 28th, not the 24th, as the code would imply, but still. Um, and this code update is huge. Mm. And um, I have to say, um, I visited American Pinball um, the Monday after Pinball Expo, and I got to play Oktoberfest in their lobby uh, for, I'd say, at least 20-plus games. Um, And compared to how I know or remember uh, the game, the current update is uh, impressive. It really turned into a very fun game. Well, I have to agree with that because I was I played it before the show. I uh, went to um, Pac Man Entertainment with uh, with our uh, our phone in guest actually because um, um, who who we never get to actually talk to. So I thought the only one I'm going to get to talk to him is to, is to go to Chicago and talk to him. So Gary Flower. Right. And I went to Pac-Man Entertainment, and we played Oktoberfest. That was, that was, in fact, the only game we played there. And um, as it turned out, um, it was running this new version of Code in in uh, pre-release form. Right. Although I, I didn't sort realize of, it sort of time. like the game was on test, basically with the new Code. Yes, that's right. And uh, I should probably have been uh, been given a bit of a clue by the fact that uh, as we were playing it. Um, who, who should wander over and, and uh, start talking to us. But, yes, Josh Kugler and Joe Schuber, um, who are obviously keeping a close eye on the game to see whether anything froze or locked up or whether there are any display issues or lighting issues. Um, and um, Toby had a, a good chat about how the, the code works. And it wasn't really until, because I didn't get a chance to play it at the show, it wasn't until after the show where I went to go and play a, a good friend's um, Oktoberfest that I realised that he was running the latest release code, but it looked a lot earlier than the version that we were playing. Some of the animations didn't look anywhere near as polished, particularly the corkscrew one. And I know um, they talked about that in the, in the seminar. Right. Uh, and, um, but yeah, it definitely did make, I, I, I said to him, you know, you should update your code because this isn't the latest one. He said, yes, it is. So, Oh, I must've been playing an earlier one then. And, uh, but yes, it does. There's a lot more voice calls. That's, that's something I really noticed that to tell you what to do at various points in the game and, uh, some other music tracks as well. Um, mm-hmm. much, much improved animations in certain places. Right. Um, and apparently some bug fixes, which I, I don't know because uh, I never experienced any bugs. So, uh, um, but it was fun um, playing. We actually went back to play um, play Oktoberfest the, the very next day, and uh, Josh and Joe were still there. At, I don't know, oh had gone God. home. Troy <laughs> must have gone home in between when they shut down the bar. But uh, but they were they were there and actually playing the game. So we got to play uh, a four player game with with them and. Uh, and they were able to explain how, uh, how various features work. So it's always always good to play a game with the people who really know how, how it's how it works, or at least how it's meant to work. Right. So, um, uh, basically, uh, here's a note to everybody who played Oktoberfest and thought like, "Nah, this might not be for me." Um, really, you should give the game a second chance because with the new code, it's a lot more fun to play. And. Um, uh, Seriously, um, I really enjoyed myself and I was really impressed with how the game uh, improved, so to speak, from uh, earlier code that I uh, remember playing. 
Yeah, I agree. I had no idea what I was doing when I first played it. And um, I, I thought I was going to be in that situation when I started playing the native version, but it did. It t- tells you what to do, and it tells you why you should do things. So it makes a lot more sense. Um, so, yeah, software can, can radically change how a game plays. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and there's even more news uh, from uh, American Pinball, although we, I think we have to be a little tight on how much we reveal. Um, but uh, I think it's safe to say American Pinball have been uh, working on a redemption game um, which is designed by Brian Hansen, who you might remember from Capcom Pinball, and he, I think he also was briefly involved with uh, Jersey Jack at some mm-hmm. point. Yeah, um, right. It's a redemption game. It will be revealed at the upcoming IAPA show, which is yep. uh, this month, I think, second week of November, something like that. Well, I can say, and I think without uh, giving too much away, it's it's a large piece yes we say. <laughs> yeah it's not like pinball size or smaller no it's a lot bigger it is yeah yeah uh, okay i will not say any more than that but um, i'm not sure whether i can reveal the title or not but i i i um uh, i saw the game when i got the tour uh, mm. when i visited them and i thought like how kind of you guys to 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 theme a game after me <laughs> very good yes i i hadn't, hadn't put that, that together but yeah um well I, I you always need to say what it is now or nobody's going to get the joke well i guess they will uh figure it out uh, when we start talking about it um next week but it has to do something with uh my origin and what i do to get uh, to uh, means America. of transportation yes yes okay Right. Well, um, it's interesting that I know. I, I think we, we both both spoke to uh, Javal and, and other people at the company, and they are very keen to to get more sales from uh, into from op- well sales to two operators. Right. They really. want to get their games out into uh, bars, and obviously, you know, a game like Oktoberfest should be an, a, a natural fit in in many different bars and, and breweries. Um, but I think they're feeling that they haven't got the distribution network set up in order to, to to get the games to potential buyers. So they are they're looking to get more into uh, operator sales, and I would s- suggest that uh, maybe the um, the redemption game is is also part of that push, you know, right. to, to get to get into that market. If they come up with just a pinball. Then people, you know, people are running family entertainment centres or um, or other similar arcade type places, may not be interested in just pinball. But if you can come up with a couple of games, and one of which is a redemption, then you, then you, you know, you probably get your foot in the door a bit more easily. Right. So, and um, personally, I think at the moment the operator market is the market that might be the easiest to grow your numbers in. Um, uh, for for many years we heard that um, Stern have been selling like 50% of their games to operators and, and the other half to uh, collectors and home uh, uh, users mm-hmm. um, or, or rec room buyers um, and they call that the three-legged stool but that three-legged stool basically turns out that operators well many of the operators in America are actually pinball enthusiast collectors that happen to uh, uh, that have no more room for their game uh, at home and instead they operate it in a uh, in a local barcade Um, uh, but that basically meant that the the the, the portion of games actually being sold to operators in the sense of of really arcade operators as their business Mm -hmm. uh, that that has been shrinking for years and years and years and personally I think that might have to do with how pinball has been earning on location I think if there would be a manufacturer that would focus on um, uh, actually pinball making money on location instead of focusing on making games with deep rules so that uh, uh, tournament players are happy and, and home use owners are happy because they get to play 45 minutes of a game without being bored by it. Um, I think 
manufacturers that would focus on these operators and just giving them a simple game to operate, uh, um, that could actually be a very big market. Oh, yes, I agree that um, that simpler games for operators are something which, you know, Stern have been been pushing towards as well with their pro models. That's, yeah, that's, how, that's how the whole nature of the three the three range, or three model range. Yeah, but I still think it's slightly different because even the pro models are rather complex and for the average player are way too complex to understand. And I think operators are more looking for something that uh, if a 10-year-old kid walks up and, and starts playing the game, he has immediately to understand what the goal of the game is or what he should be doing or aiming for. And with all the respect, with with the current pro games, they might be priced uh, slightly cheaper, but they're still not that uh, easy to understand. Mm. Well, it is interesting that the, the first two games that we, we've covered, the first two new releases that we covered from uh, from Quetzal and from Haggis um, are both relatively simple playfield designs. Right. Uh, and um, you and, would and, guess and, that and from that there'll be relatively simple rules. And it doesn't stop there because we uh, there's another manufacturer working mm. on a simple game which we'll get to after the Rob Burke interview. So hang on, there's more mm. coming. Okay. Right. So... Um, I think, apart from the fact that uh, American Pinball uh, were cagey about um, saying anything about their next title uh, at the Pinball Expo. They, they did uh, reveal their yeah. third game will be Game 3. Wow. I don't think anybody saw that coming. So... Uh, <laughs> So anyway, that's uh, yeah, that's about it was a good point to to uh, to move on from American Pinball, right? Uh, and uh, who should we who should we go to next? Um, well, uh, let's see. Uh, so the plan was to stick with the uh, Pinball Expo uh, yes. topics first. I think hmm. we covered most of those. I think we have. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Right. So uh, this would be a good time to uh, skip to the interview that we did with. Uh, Mr. Rob Burke, organizer of Pinball Expo, uh, where we talked about him uh, after Expo and we asked him how he felt or how he was looking back on this year's edition of Pinball Expo. So, we're here at the conclusion of Pinball Expo 2019, 35th edition, and we're here with Rob Burke, the uh, main organizer of the show with his team, of course, he doesn't do it all by himself. Um, Not forgetting Bridget, of course. No, who, well, it's who's a team the, effort, yeah. right? So, and... It's become a family affair. Right, so let's, um, let's look back at um, your... Give a brief overview of this year's show. What were your feelings? Are you happy with the way everything went? Well, for me, the... Um, sometimes I sit back and just cannot believe it's gone this many years. Yeah. Because in any event you do, especially one person doing the same event over and over again, you wonder how you can even come up with the material to make it interesting. What can we do next year? What can we do next year? And to be honest with you guys, every year I do this show, I think to myself, how am I going to top what I did the previous year? So uh, it always seems to happen, though. I, I, I go to other shows, get some ideas. I think to myself what people want to see. And um, at the end of the day, you know, the show is for the people, it's for the, the, the collectors, for the, for the pinball community. And as long as they're happy, I'm happy. And, you know, I'm always looking for suggestions and ideas from them because uh, you never know what may come out of, of, out of their minds as far as what we could do to, to make the expo even better experience for everybody. Mm. So, um, from my experience, I'd say it will be difficult to talk this year because you really went all out. Yeah. And, you know, every five years we go all out, to be honest with you. So yeah. what concerns me the most is, to me, the most colorful people that come at the seminars are those guys that have been involved in the industry for a long time. Mm. Yeah. Once so whether it be the Bally guys or the Pat Lawlers or Larry DeMars or some of the great Williams guys, or Steve Ritchie, Mark Ritchie, George Gomez, the list goes on and on. But the point being, uh, either these guys won't be around forever, 
or two, they just don't want to be involved in the expo. They just want to enjoy their retirement. Right. So it, it, it's an ongoing battle for me, but to me, nothing beats the old stories that come from these guys because they're so rich with history. Right. Which is, I would say that it does seem as if, looking at the show, it's get, it just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And with that, you're actually you're using the whole of the hotel. Yeah, yeah, so aren't you? There, it, there's it, nowhere else you can ex- unless you go into the parking lot out here. Yeah, they, <laughs> the hotel actually That's offered. That's the idea for next year. Yeah, the hotel actually offered tents if I wanted to do some tents outside. But you know, if you got bad weather, it's not so great of an idea. Yeah, yeah. But, is, um, is, there, is there any way you can expand the show even even more? I mean, you've got so much of it packed in. You could almost do with a little more space. Yeah, I was told that the restaurant actually has a, a, a banquet facility or an area that would house the same uh, number of people that, that are housed for the seminars. Oh, right. So I guess, yeah. in theory, mm-hmm. I could have it. Yeah. Unfortunately, they want to charge, and it's a pretty hefty charge just to rent out mm-hmm. the room for three, two or three days. Yeah. But that, I, that thought, that idea is out there. But, uh, you know, when I took over the show a couple of years ago, that's one thing I want to do is get the whole hotel to uh, do the show and use every available inch. Right. Well, the interesting thing is um, uh, a couple of years ago, people were saying, like, if you want to play pinball, this is not the show to go to. That completely changed. If you want to play pinball, there's really, like, hundreds of games available here. Yeah, our count this year was not quite as high as I wanted. I think we're at 460. I was hoping to hit 500. But I guess after a while, who counts once you're past 300, I'd say, is the, is the magic number because there's machines everywhere. But, um, you know, just so everyone gets a chance to play and experience pinball, that's why we're all here. Right. I asked you this question earlier, and um, you said nobody, nobody's really asked you it before. Um, when you first, first started back with the very first expo, uh, what was the... Did you have any sort of ideas of of the format of the show, were, were, you, were you taking your inspiration from any other events that you've seen or experienced? Yeah, another hobby of mine is uh, I enjoy fireworks, and there's actually a an organization that promotes fireworks that is more for firework enthusiasts called the PGI.org. <laughs> but um, I've been involved with that with that organization since the 70s. But I kind of got the format of our show based on the format of how they did their events. And they still do. They're, they're celebrating 50 years uh, this past year. But um, And since then, a lot of other shows have followed the format that you established for, yeah, for pinball shows. Yeah, exactly right. And it seems to work. People like the educational part of it. They like to meet some of the artists and designers. And, uh, of course, they like to play the machines. So it's easy for me because I, I thought from day one when I did this show, that in order to, for Expo to survive and do well, it needed the support of the industry. So that was one of the reasons why I live in Ohio, but that's mm. why the show takes place in, in Chicago here. Yeah. It's the heart of the industry. And for me to ask someone to speak or come to the event, mm. basically it, it's a drive from their house to the hotel. It's, you know, you, you can do it relatively easily. Right. Versus the other shows where the, the promoters are at the mercy of flying one guy in, two guys, three guys maybe, but to fly in 40, like, forget it. You know, it's just it's not yeah. practical. It's not realistic. So that was that is definitely an advantage we have. Right. So as an organizer, obviously, there's a lot of work up front. And then there is the hour that the doors open and everybody basically, well, it's not like people are already in the hotel and, and, and they come down. The, the show starts, bumper blast, and lots of familiar faces, but what I'm wondering is, as an organizer, do you still get the chance to actually enjoy your own show? And the answer is maybe 50-50. <laughs> mm. um, you know why? Because there's just always so many little fires to put out. That just when, when you think you want to relax, something comes out. I, I had an opportunity to, to um, have a drink with... Um, Tom Neiman from Valley last night, and Paul Ferris, and uh, Billy O'Donnell. And um, I meant to m- meet him across the street there at the local bu- 
little pub. Mm -hmm. Hour and a half went by. I finally, finally got there. By the time I got there, they were had done, done drinking, done eating, and they were ready to head home. Yeah. So the point being, the idea was there, but just, you know, you just got to put the fires out and take care of the show first. The show's number one. Yeah. Yeah. But um, despite all the hard work that goes into it, you, you still, your enthusiasm for putting on the next show is, seems to be undiminished. If yeah. not, grows more with each one. And you, you said you want to you want to top each previous show. Yeah, in a way, it's more of a challenge now, because you know, being a showman in the way that I feel I am, um, I want to put on a an event that I feel people will leave feeling like they got their minds worth. And, and, and so, it's more challenging for me to come up with more ideas. <clears throat> Or something we can do to make it interesting for you guys to return and, and for the people to return. So you won't ever get to the point where you, you put on the perfect show and you're just going to copy that every year from there yeah, onwards. Yeah, you know, like this year was pretty forever. We usually were pretty forever, but I mean, a lot of people spoke very highly of it. But, you know, you, you wonder how you, how you can keep that emotional high year to year. It, it's really, really difficult in any event. There's always something that people will find fault with, whether, whether they mean to or not. And as a promoter, I'll say to myself, you know, they're right. I, I missed, I missed this here. I missed, I missed this little thing. So it's the details is what people remem remember. All right. Well, there are quite a few details over here in the sense that there was so much going on. Um, whether you were here just for one day or for the entire event, it was basically an overflow of. Um, pinball. You know what it is, Jonathan? I think it was. I think it was pinball overload because there was so much going on. No matter what level of interest you are in, in this hobby, there was something for everybody. And, and the problem is, is just get to the point. Maybe there's not enough hours in the day. Well, that's that's something I was do feeling. Yeah. So, so the question is, do we extend another day so, instead of starting at Wednesday? Do we start at Tuesday, for instance? Mm. Or, then, or continue on the Sunday. Or that's another option. Because there's just isn't enough hours a day, and typically Sunday is a good travel day. You know, we feel worth the mercy of the vendors, and we want it to be a good experience for them. But um, to ask them to stay half a day on Sunday, or whatever, it just doesn't seem mm. fair to me. Yeah. Because they want to get home, they got a life, they got a family. It's true, you know, but most, travel most of the other shows are. On Saturdays and Sundays, so you're right. They, they're sort of used to that. But then again, we start Wednesday. They start maybe I think Thursday or Friday, whatever it may be. And so you have you have vendors coming in from from pretty long distances as well. Right. So, so you know, the drive home's not just a, you know an hour or so. It's like a roll of dice. You know, you, you try you get one idea, and, and maybe three of the vendors like it, but the majority don't like it, or vice versa. So it's you got to really think a lot of decisions out. Um. Obviously, you're already looking ahead for the, for the future because obviously you we have the days, yeah. So, uh, are we next year going to be the West End or the same, same hotel next year? Okay, under contract. And it, it's just a matter. You know, the other thing I'm struggling with is I may find a larger venue here or there, but some of these venues charge enormous electrical fees. Yeah, true. So I mean, I, I have, I'm battling with that now, but if the fees are double or triple what I'm paying now, do I still move? Well, maybe not. Maybe, as the saying goes, maybe it's not so bad after all. The grass isn't yeah, greener somewhere is else. Yeah. Yeah. So these are struggles I have to deal with to try to determine what to do. So you are, you are looking at other venues to, to well, see what the options looking, are. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So the dates are already set. Um, are you willing to announce these? Uh, yes. I, I'm going to have you announce it since, since you're the, you guys are the first in the news. So, who wants to announce it? I have no Whoa. idea when the dates are. So. Well, you tell us. Uh, October 18th to 20th. You 18th. know, if everything makes sense in the science I'm reading. 18th, 19th, that's three days, though. 18th, 19th, 20th. So, 17th, 18th, 19th, 20th. <laughs> let's, look, let's look at our calendar. So, we're talking 2020 here. Yeah, so it's that week. Um, in, in October next year. Mm -hmm. So, if you went to Pimmel Expo, mark it in your calendar because you might want to return. And if you haven't been here, then you definitely have to mark it in your calendar because you want to be here. And this, uh, 
the hotel rooms here often sell out very quickly once uh, well, the deals are available. Is, like any of these events, more and more they're selling out. Because yes. Once people hear that, you know, it was, it was a great opportunity, a great experience, then when they say, hey, we got, we got to join the crowd. So are people able to book the yes. hotel room for next year yes, now? Sir. Yep. All right, okay. Well, there you are. Is there a code they need or they just ring up and say, we're coming for Pinball Just Expo. say, uh, you know Martin, and that should be <laughs> all you need to know. <laughs> okay. We'll just I'll take, take my guys. usual cut. Yeah. yeah. I'm checking here. So, the yeah, 7 19. So Wednesday was the 12th. Okay. We gotta find a sign here. We'll, okay. we'll let you know, fans out there in, in radio land. We'll, we'll look you know. it up and we'll add it. We'll, we'll add it. Yeah, we'll send it out. Sure. But um, we had a great event this year, and uh, for anyone listening to this podcast, we want you to know that our our intentions are to keep the momentum going and not go backwards. So it would be a great experience for those who haven't come. And honestly, guys out there. I think what I really enjoy seeing the most is the international flavor. Jonathan, with you and Martin coming in, because for them, for me to see them is exciting because they're getting a chance to meet a lot of uh, great pinball people from America or all over the world. So it's, it's kind of cool to hook up with you guys, putting a, a name to, to uh, or a face to the name, and just seeing um, all the great people out there in this community. Right, but it's not just Martin and me. There's a lot more international visitors. I've seen people from Japan and... Um, Italy. Brazil. Germany. Brazil. Mm-hmm. We had several come from Spain. Yeah. Plus, I think the games I brought from Spain were such a big hit, we'll probably bring them back again. Mm. But it's stuff you just don't see every day. Spain's got their own unique pinball market, and it's a cottage industry that kind of started from scratch. But they have got some really cool games, so... Um, you know, um, I hope op- I um, open up the idea for your listening audience to even email me with their thoughts or ideas. It's uh, brkpinball at gmail dot com. If you care to share anything you, you might want to share, you know, privately or whatever. But uh, you know, we want the show to be great. Great. Well, thanks very much for joining us and uh, and talking through uh, this year's show. And con- congratulations on your thirty fifth. Uh, wow. Show your uh, is that 34 years of Pinball Expo. Thank you, Mark. Appreciate it. Thank you, and hope to see you guys next year. I look forward to coming back. And, That's a good uh, thing. Yeah, absolutely. It's absolutely wonderful event. So I love being here, being a part of it. You know, I think and what we're missing though is a mascot. We need like a, I don't know, a yeah, right. or something that'd be a mascot. Hmm. A dog, a certain kind of breed of dog. Uh, I don't yeah. know what. Uh, Squirrel, I don't know what. Well, cow. If you have any ideas, what cow would be? It should be a cow. <laughs> Get some free milk and, and, and pet the cow. Mm-hmm. So, uh, well, if any of our listeners have any ideas for what would be a cool mascot for yeah, Pinball Expo, call it in. You know, we can't do a Greco, but that would be fun. But think of some ideas, bring them in, and we might incorporate something new next year. Okay. Well. Thanks for your time. Thanks for organizing such a great show. And we look forward to coming back next year. Great. See you guys again. Okay, well, thanks thanks to Rob for taking time out from, obviously, what's a very busy time for him to talk to us about uh, about the show and, uh, and his plans. And as you as you can see, or uh, well, you can certainly hear from Rob, he's, uh, he's very upbeat and happy with the way it's gone and has big plans for the future as well for yeah. the show. Although it appears that uh, we might be sticking uh, or staying in Wheeling while I was actually hoping that we might be moving to Schaumburg. Yeah, well, certainly next year um, we're going to be back in Wheeling. uh, And the dates for that, as you heard, um, are are already set. So... um, as as Rob um, said in the in the interview, it's important uh, that if you uh, you want to guarantee yourself a, a room at the West End, that you you book that early because uh, they do sell out as uh, as we we've learned from experience. So uh, don't hang about or uh, unless you want to uh, want to find cheaper accommodation elsewhere. Then uh, personally, I've always found it, it worth the extra money to to be in the the show hotel just uh, for the convenience of being able to to uh, return to your room at any point. Right. Okay. 
Now, there are uh, a couple of other manufacturers that um, were not present at Pinball Expo, although some uh, had a tie-in, and um, by that I mean Spooky Pinball, who um, uh, were not at Pinball Expo, but they were at the Pinball Live open house, which was held the Thursday and Friday um, of Pinball Expo, um, where they auctioned off uh, total Nuclear Annihilation number 550 for the uh, Juvenile Diabetes uh, Research uh, Fund or something like that. Yeah, uh, I can't help you out on that. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> and um, um, uh, obviously uh, they uh, uh, modded that game um, heavily. Uh, it looked very beautiful actually. Um, so uh, that one was auctioned off, as well as the very first uh, limited edition of Medieval Madness uh, remake, hmm. which came from the personal collection of um, Doug Doug Tuba, right? Hmm. Um, which included the uh, the topper as well, and um, I think we forgot to mention that uh, Medieval Madness is now equipped with the larger color display. Yeah, the limited edition one certainly is. Yes. yes. So and um, but, so but that's that, but that was included in, in the auction at Pinball Life, right? And uh, I think in total, uh, the auction raised uh, over twenty eight thousand dollars for uh, diabetes research. Um, uh, so research. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, oh, um, come on. congratulations to to everyone involved in that, and um, for the generosity of uh, both Spooky Pinball and Chicago Gaming in uh, donating these games. Right. So, um, and while on the topic of uh, Spooky Pinball, um, we mentioned earlier that they will finish uh, the um, Alice Cooper. Nightmare Castle production uh, by the beginning of December is expected. Um, they did actually show a topper which is currently being developed for uh, the Alice Cooper game, uh, which um, uh, is an interactive topper as well. Uh, with lots of lights uh, uh, interacting with gameplay, but there's mm -hmm. also like uh, a bottled brain that is moving from left to right, and um, uh, there's four like um, uh, meters that could be voltmeters or whatever right, yeah. that are also uh, moving in sync uh, to uh, uh, either the left or the right. Uh, with the right means that they're full on, and um, um, yeah, it looked like a fun topper uh, uh, that 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 goes with the with the game. Um, not sure when that will be available, but it's in development, and uh, people got a chance to look at it. Um, Seems like everyone is making toppers these days. Yeah, apparently there's a uh, big market for pinball toppers. Yeah, yeah. Obviously, everyone's got high ceilings in in their game rooms. Yeah. Um, I think Scott Denisi announced on uh, Pinside that there will not be an additional run of Total Nuclear Annihilation in between Alice Cooper and the next game that goes into production from Spooky Pinball. Um, and the new Scott Denisi game has not been announced yet either. Um, no. But you'd expect that to happen any time between, well, rather soon, because I figured after Christmas they want to go into production with something else. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, assuming that uh, that Scott's game is going to be the the next one on the line, or the next uh, next new release, I should say. Now, obviously, they could go back and and remake some some other titles if if they had the uh, demand for them. But uh, yeah, you'd think Scott's game is uh, uh, which was has the the code name I think of Haunted House Party, but that obviously isn't the real name. Um, that will. Uh, we expect to see that in uh, uh, very early next year. Right. And, um, yeah, we're all curious to see what that will be uh, like. I think I read some comments that... Um, not even sure, but I think 
what I read was that Scott is very happy how his new game is coming along. So, okay, well, we're just curious. No surprise there. Well, well, uh, if he uh, could be that he's on a designer's block or whatever you call Mm -hmm. it, and that he might not be happy at all. Um, But apparently, that's not the case. So good, good. Okay, Uh, we 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 did when we're talking about. Toppers just now, and, uh, and Chicago Gaming's medieval madness one, with the uh, the LED lighting and uh, and, the, and the models of the of the trolls and the king. Right. Um, we should also mention just in in passing there that um, with the new medieval madness uh, version has RGB lighting across the entire playfield, including um, GI which is something that the original Medieval Madnesses didn't have. Now, uh, talking to Chicago Gaming about that, it's, uh, they, they do plan to make a, an upgrade kit available for those people who bought the original Medieval Madnesses with just the uh, the plain white lighting. So they, We're to- still talking about the remake ones, right? Not the Williams ones. Yes, absolutely, yes. The original remakes. Yes, good point. Not the uh, This won't be... Uh, won't be uh, retrofitted into uh, the Williams games. But those who, who bought the first run of Chicago Gaming Medieval Madnesses, they will be able to get an upgrade kit to give full RGB lighting uh, throughout the entire game. Uh, no no details on pricing on that yet, or, or indeed exactly when it's going to be available, but it's certainly... Uh, in Chicago Gaming's plans to to have that available, if uh, if you'd like to uh, benefit from all the all the wonderful lighting effects that the, that the new system has, right? Okay. So, um, so um, I'd say we let's, let's, say. Mo- let's move on to someone who's who is actually producing games uh, rather than somebody who's uh, who's not. So. Um, Let's let's go to your backyard then, and um, and and find out what the latest news is from from Dutch Pinball and and what how Barry's getting on with uh, with his plans to to put the game back into production. Right. Well, I haven't spoken to Barry uh, a lot last month. The only uh, well, I did briefly uh, uh, text with him where he basically announced, I'm too busy building games, I will not be giving my presentation as promised on the Dutch Pinball Open Expo, because that will cost me a week and I can't afford a week, uh, because I'm building games. So the good news is, he's building games. Uh, More importantly, he's even shipping games. Yes, I've seen pictures of uh, what I, I would take to be new build games arriving at, at buyers' homes. Those yes. are people who who bought the new games or, or paid the money recently, not the uh, early achievers, um, yeah. who will who, who will be uh, should receive their games later on down the line. Yeah, but these uh, new uh, customers are actually important uh, because they bring in new money, which oh, is absolutely. Uh, much needed to make sure that Dutch Pinball will get to build these games for uh, for the early achievers or pre-order uh, buyers, uh, depending on how you want to call it. Um, so uh, uh, Barry and Goose are currently in their new facility. Um, they are uh, building it. Who's, who's Goose? Goose is... is um, this is a new name. Well, it's not a new name, actually. If you... Um, <laughs> It might be a new name for um, uh, some people, but uh, Goose has been uh, involved with Dutch Pinball uh, since the very beginning. I think he was even part of the design team, and um, uh, and he's still uh, uh, an associate, I'd say, uh, in some way, uh, close friends uh, of Barry, and he's involved in... Uh, the way I understand it, uh, building the games together with Barry at the moment. Um, currently, they are cranking out like two to three games a week, uh, which are uh, being shipped out as soon as they can. So once the game is ready, tested, burned in and everything, then ship it out the door. Um and um, I understood from Barry that he is already talking to uh, several parties for outsourcing uh, certain uh, assembly work, where we're talking about sub-assemblies that need to be assembled separately and then as mm-hmm. an assembled piece uh, gets fitted into the game. 
Um, and he's looking to source that out to uh, to some local uh, parties, and he's having conversations with them. Uh, so that's a good thing as well, and um, that should uh, make it a little easier for them to um, uh, to speed up the process of building games. And I also know um, I was told that um, they were still waiting for. Um, and now I'm trying to think what the correct names are. Um, basically, they were waiting for uh, racks and such to store parts in uh, because everything was still mostly on the floor and right. they were looking for parts like oh we need this part where is it uh, it's over there and now everything the, the shelving system and so on um, is apparently in place which makes it easier for them to get to the parts that they need and uh, that also improves the, the or the, makes it easier to build the games and uh, the, the quicker to build the games yeah, and not uh, so you don't hurt their back so much bending over all the time to pick up parts off the floor. Right, exactly. So, um, so that's about the news that there is um, uh, from Dutch Pinball at the moment. But um, as far as I can see, it's all uh, they're building games, they're delivering games, so that's all good. And, so the, uh, they didn't they didn't have any presence at Pinball Expo though this year no. to try and sell their games. Oh, no, I, 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 I know something about that. They were uh, actually there was supposed to be a new build the Big Lebowski game at the uh, coin taker booth um, but apparently DHL who was shipping the game messed that up and they um, didn't get it through customs in time oh. that's at least what I understood so that's a shame I'm sure people would have been interested in seeing um, the quality of the, the new games coming out of the, the factory yes but uh, hopefully they'll, uh, they'll get to see Plenty of those machines around before too much longer. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, I'm I'm confident they uh, that that they will. So now a a game you may not see around unless you happen to visit China um, is uh, is a new. I wouldn't say it's a, an announcement, but it's been teased by Mike Kalinowski of Homepin, and. Um, it's aimed primarily, at, although not exclusively, at the Chinese market, and I think Mike's very keen to point that out, that it's not it, it's not something which would be of no interest to Western buyers. It's just that um, the way it's been uh, built and um, designed, it's, it's done in Chinese at the moment, and it uses a, a Chinese or a theme which is familiar to uh, Chinese players or buyers, uh, called China Zombies. Right. And uh, well, you've spoken to Mike um, very recently, um, Jonathan. Yes. Um, well, Actually, what, we have what, an interview with Mike coming up. So, but we'll indeed, get to that. yes. Yeah. So, um, are there any other details about um, about this game and whether we're going to see it in the UK or the UK, in the US or Europe or anywhere else um, in a westernized form? Yes, well, there, um, uh, the game is currently being developed. Um, in the interview, Mike will exactly tell you how far they are along, but he expects to go into production in like a month, which is rather soon, I'd say. Yeah, ambitious. Yeah. Um, so the, the, the theme is uh, China Zombies, and uh, the, which is something, according to Mike, everybody in China is familiar with. Uh, um, and uh, um, he sent me an email um, where he explained that um, <coughs> unlike uh, zombies in the West that, that tend to, to walk with their arms uh, uh, ahead of or, or forward, um, China zombies actually hop, and they uh, have created a mechanism to create a hopping zombie, China zombie, um, that is on the play field, uh, which should be rather entertaining, I guess. I'm not sure. Overall, it will be a very simple game. Um, it is primarily, uh, uh, or they decoded it in uh, uh, with the display and the voice calls in Chinese, but there will also be a English version. Right. So, okay. um, if if people in the West are interested in uh, getting this game, they can, and if they prefer to 
uh, uh, switch it to English, that should not be a problem. If they prefer to have it in Chinese and not understand the clue what's going on, that's also an option. Mm. But like you said, um, last night I spoke with Mike Kalinowski and um, I was lucky enough to be able uh, to record that uh, conversation and uh, Mike gave me the okay to, uh, to actually publish that in our podcast. So uh, why don't we have a listen to what Mike has to say about the game? Okay. China is on this. Cool. Uh, obviously, uh, well, you didn't reveal anything of the playfield yet. Um, no, because we, actually, we're still finalising that art. It's been changed about six times, and I've only just firmed up the um, the lamp board layout. So that sort of clinches the the layout that we have to run with. But they're still they're still playing with the artwork for that. So uh, right. we're not sort of that's it's close, but it's not finished just yet. So um, the right. gameplay is pretty much pretty much cemented, but there's a few movement bits there too but uh it's a simple layout with a single ramp and return rail um but it's a it's a fast fun sort of layout open very open play field um and it's targeting remember who it's targeting it's targeting new players who have very likely never even seen a pinball machine at all before right so it, it it needs to be very very obvious what you've got to do. It can't have hidden things or you know deep meanings or hit this target twenty times to do something else and then get in the ramp. No, no none of that stuff because the players that it's aiming for don't understand even how to hit the ball with a flipper. You've got to show them where the flipper buttons are. So um, you know it's it's just it's got good sound. It's got good graphics on the DMD and. Um, Good music, and it's you know good light show, enough to keep them intrigued at least. Right. So so, um, how come China zombies? In the sense that, um, uh, from what I understood, this has to do with with uh, when people are uh, uh, dead and uh, buried. Uh, it's it's almost like a, a, a sort of a funeral type of theme which doesn't seem to be yes, no it's, it's no it's very well known in in chinese we looked at several different things to go down the licensed route and and figured that this was an easy way into the market with a well-known theme that's not licensed because we really want to keep it as budget priced as possible mm -hmm. and uh, that's our foray is to get it as cheap as possible every single chinese person instantly recognizes what a chinese zombie is they all know it um, so it's firstly it's recognisable, and then they're drawn to the machine. They say, "Oh, we know what China Zombies is, but what's this weird machine?" And so it it attracts their interest to the machine, which is what we're aiming at. Right. We can worry about license things and, and increasing the price down the track, but our main thrust is to get it into the marketplace at a price that's competitive to Stern and Stern machines currently are, um, well, forget the fact that there's an extra 25% on them at the moment because of the trade war, uh, but they sell here 60, yeah, 64,000 RMB. So you do the maths yourself. Um, they sell for 64,000. Ours sells for 34,000, half the price. Right. And, uh, and theirs now, that 64,000 is plus 25% currently with the trade war. We're better than half price with a Chinese theme, with Chinese writing, with Chinese on the DMD, with Chinese call-outs, and, um, you know, it's it's. I believe it's going to appeal to them better. The staff here love it. They've obviously had a great deal of input into it. And when is this game supposed to uh, come out? We're just finalising that mech I sent you the picture of, which I thought was a good teaser picture for a mechanism. Mm -hmm. Um that's probably oh, you know, a few days to a week away from being finished and then we can order the toys. Uh, they're just 3D models we're using at the moment, of course, 3D printed, and uh, just to get the sizing exact and so on. And um, we can order the models, but the artwork for the playfield, I'm expecting that any day. Uh, I've had a few preliminary ones sent to me. They're just dressing it up. So the minute that's done, we can build a final playfield and um, we're pretty much you know, ready to go within the month, I'd say. Any big trade shows coming up? Uh, there's one in Beijing, but it's not till early next year. We're going to attend a couple in um, in China with this machine. Um, we just heard this morning, in fact, from uh, a guy that lives near us that the Beijing one's a big show, so we're going to go to that. 
Uh, but we're looking for some, mostly we're looking for some that are out in the in the sticks a little bit rather than the big city ones because um, we want to get out into the into the marketplace where they have never heard of pinball. And right. the, you know, all the arcades in these places are, are just got dance machines and video game row upon row of video games, driving games, that sort of stuff. We want to get to them because that's that's where we see some future for us. Okay, cool. So, um, any any word on who designed this game? Was it either the well known pinball designer hobbying off uh, in his spare time, or is it? Some no. local new guy that that just has his first attempt at designing a pinball game. No, it's basically two older machines cobbled together to keep it simple. We picked, we picked the simplicity of a couple of older games and cobbled them together, right? And then added a few little bits of twist of our own. But it's pretty basic and simple. Um, It's got uh, a couple of features from a new game that's released, but uh, it's not it's not any game in particular. It's not you know it's just something that's fast and easy and lots of shots. Don't know how many shots. I didn't count them. One, two, three, four, five, six, six or seven shots around the top. Um, it's got a um, a scoop. Uh, and it's got a lock hole, and it's got a Newton ball, and yeah, a lot of few little extra thingies like that. Okay, um, it's not it's not intended to be a high end pinball machine at all. It's not intended to be compared with uh, anything that's currently released. It's not. There's no intention on our part for it to be compared to Elvira or um, Swords of Fury or whatever it's called or um, of Octoberfest. Race, yes, okay, yeah, it's. it's not, The intention is for it to not be compared to any of those. It's a standalone machine uh, and something that we have gleaned from certainly in this market, and I'm not sure about the West yet, but every single Chinese person has had a gut full of LCD, everything. It's on their watch, it's on their phone, it's on their computer, it's on their TV, it's on their bus, it's when they go to the subway. Everything's got an LCD screen. That's the last thing they want on their new toy. Sticking to DMD deliberately because it's totally different. They've never seen a DMD before. They don't. That they, they're curious about it. They love it. And there's other factors there too. If you if you introduce an LCD, you've suddenly introduced a hundred thousand dollars of costs to get you know, stuff to put on the DMD, and then right. people whinge that it's not appropriate or it's not enough or it's just not. And so yeah, it's just not. That's not the direction we're heading. We're we're heading in the direction of making an affordable machine, not a machine that's got all the bells and whistles and it's double the price. Right. Okay. So, and in terms of um, uh, uh, voice calls and so on with this game, uh, did you, did did you hire some some professionals to do that, or is it just a bunch of people that you fit like, hey, uh, say something like this and this, and that's fine. And uh, it's, it's a bit of a combination because we actually did pay someone to do two people, a male and a female, to do the Chinese voices, but a couple of them we just didn't like. So we re-recorded those ourselves and they came out much better. Just just to keep it in keeping with the it's it's more the it's just the flow of everything. There was nothing wrong with the voice. It just didn't sort of flow when you're playing the game, that's all. It's pretty right. tricky to get that right. Uh, we have actually replicated everything on the DMD, all the all the videos and the call outs and everything have been replicated in English as well. So we can build an English version, but that's not what we're concentrating on right now. Right. Um but like I said, our our primary focus is to get some machines sold into China because that's where we've got our advantage over every other manufacturer. We're already here. Uh We can do it in Chinese. We can do it at a price that better suits their budget, and we are stupid not to take advantage of that. Right. So, uh, but th th based on the art, I'd say um, it's not a too serious take on zombies. It's not like no, at all. The no, no, no. It's very, it's very light. There's no blood and guts. There's no gore. There's no arms ripped off, or you know, heads being bitten off. And there's none of that. It's all light and breezy. Yeah, and it, it seems see, a bit comical even, in a it's, sense. Um, it's, sure. it's comical, and it's even a little bit sort of um, Scooby Dooish. So it's light. It's light and friendly. I mean, Scooby Doo gets into sort of that sort of mischief and scary stuff, but it's all light and breezy and easy. It's not not heavy stuff. Right. 
Oh, that's an interesting interview there from, from uh, with Mike, and I think uh, he, he's obviously got a very very clear idea of exactly what he thinks the Chinese market is looking for in a pinball game, and it's and it's uh, obviously very different to um, the the much more mature market that we have over over here in the West. Well, I think, it, but it's in, in all fairness, if you look at the development that pinball has gone through through the, uh, uh, the, the, the past decades, um, uh, I'd say um, for a, a territory like China that is completely new with uh, the concept of pinball, I think it would be a smart move to sort of go for an easy to understand, uh, almost like EM type of play field, maybe with a with, with, with one ramp or, or something like that, but nothing too complex. And um, hopefully it will have an interesting uh, gameplay to keep players uh, uh, interested in the game. But I can understand that, that it's just a matter of like, okay, shoot a bunch of targets, get a bunch of tickets, and that's it. Well, it does sound like he's got a, a massive price advantage over uh, any any Western companies, particularly you know Stern trying to sell into that market. Um, firstly, from the from the lower cost of production, from being out there, but also uh, with all the, all the tariffs and and the taxes that uh, are imposed, and are even more at the moment with the current trade war going on between the US and China. Right. So um, yeah, being able to sell at you know, a half price or less of a Stern game. That's got to be an attractive, uh, attractive um, purchase for for a uh, an operator who is, you know, maybe a little sceptical about this this pinball thing, and um, may may have tried it in the past and found it not not to be accepted or not to be uh, taken on board due to the complexity. So uh, yeah, well he's uh, he's trying new things out there. So uh, so good luck to him, I say. Yeah, I'm I'm very curious how to see how this will uh, turn out. And yeah. the best of luck to Mike, and uh, obviously we'll keep you updated uh, on this progress. And I'm uh, a blatant plug for the Pinball Magazine newsletter. Uh, Mike did send me some uh, exclusive photos um, uh, that have not been published before, uh, and that it, these will be part of the Pinball Magazine newsletter of uh, uh, with the recap of October uh, 2019. So if you're not uh, a subscriber yet, make sure you're subscribed to that newsletter so you get a first peek at these uh, exclusive photos. Okay, very good. Um, so the, the well, we haven't really got any, any other news, I don't think. Um, the Suncoast Pinball, there's, as far as I can tell, there's been no further developments in, uh, in that business. And uh, they, you know, they filed for Chapter 11 in our um, last month as we covered in in that podcast and i've been looking for any further documents that have been filed with the court that might have uh, progressed that and i haven't seen anything but the the parent company as it were the sun coast arcade is still seems to be up and running and advertising and posting on facebook and um carrying on as if uh, everything is is fine so so maybe they have uh, managed to come to a deal and uh, and Suncoast Arcade are still making the video games although they do still call themselves Suncoast Arcade and Pinball but there's, there's no trace of any pinball involved uh, and Suncoast Pinball website uh, doesn't exist anymore and uh, neither does their Facebook account right. so uh, it doesn't look good uh, for pinball production from uh, from Florida right so oh well um, speaking of Florida obviously um, uh, the uh, Houston uh, no, the yeah, the Houston Arcade Expo is coming up, um, which is which is not a million miles away from Florida, I suppose. No, no, that, yeah, <laughs> but also the IAPA show um, yes. is uh, coming up in Florida. That is actually in Florida, um, and uh, usually there's also the uh, I think it's called the Free Play Florida. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, which is uh, tying in with that show, I think, either the weekend before or the weekend after. I'm not entirely sure. Uh, but that's also an uh, interesting event to attend. And also, if you want to get a look at American Pinball's um, Redemption game, and you find yourself in the uh, position to visit the IAPA show, then 
Uh, that might be a reason for you to go there. Um, at the uh, Houston Arcade Expo, um, Deep Group have uh, have announced that they um, will be sort of um, uh, uh, showing uh, or testing, I would probably say, uh, the uh, Retro Atomic uh, Zombie Adventureland uh, prototype. Um, I actually talked to uh, Stephen Bowden, who's working at the company um, uh, while he was at uh, Expo, and he said that he will probably be telling everybody it's not finished it's a prototype uh, it's still in the works and oh well um that's about as much news as i got from deep root pinball um mm. other than that uh, obviously dennis norman who was also at expo uh, who is designing for deep root is uh, not allowed to say much but he is really hoping that um uh, their games go into production and that they can start showing them off because uh, what the, what I understand or what everybody is telling me is that they can't uh, they they really are excited for what they are working on so that's a good thing I guess yeah great so if you want to want to see what Deep Root have to show in, in whatever form that is um, then get yourself along to the Houston Arcade and Pinball Expo. Right. Um, which is uh, held at the, the Marriott West Chase on uh, November the 15th and 16th. Right. Uh, so. And while we're on the topic of uh, pinball shows, um, the weekend of uh, November 9th and 10th, the Dutch Pinball Open Expo will be taking place, which is uh, uh, the biggest pinball event in Europe, I would say. Um, this year it will be held in uh, the city of Zwolle, which I'm not suppose uh, I don't suppose will ring a bell with many people. But okay, it's in the Netherlands. Um, it's uh, near Amsterdam. It's uh, like an hour away from from Amsterdam, something like that. Um, and um, I've been getting a lot of questions from people like, who will be the special guest? Because usually we fly in a special guest. Um, I can't confirm it 100% yet, but we're looking to fly in Mr. Doug Watson. Um, that might still fall through, so um, it's not... Uh, I'd say keep an eye on uh, the social media uh, that is uh, related to the Dutch Pinball Open Expo, uh, where this will be confirmed um, if it all will uh, happen um, but I'm very happy that uh, Doc Watson um, is available and uh, interested in coming over now it's a matter of can we get the tickets within budget and all that kind of stuff and with less than a week to go or sort of um, yeah it will be a, a tight promotion but uh, nevertheless I think Doc Watson is a very interesting and big name um, that a lot of people might be interested in listening to what he has to say. Yeah, he's got um, a huge back catalogue of, of work in uh, not just in pinball but in, in other areas as well. And uh, he's a very eloquent speaker about about that work and uh, and has some great stories to tell. Um, some of which, of course, you can uh, you can see in the seminar that he did at pinball expo but he's got far far more to tell and uh, obviously signing stuff and uh, telling relating personal details about how, how certain artwork was created and uh, the story behind it and uh, you no know, the the other possible things that, that could have happened yeah. with, with the way a game turned out you know there's so much you can learn just from from seeing somebody and being able to ask some questions in person yeah. um, it would be fantastic if uh, if doug can make it uh, yeah, I would be very happy if he could. Um, and what's interesting, um, usually when I'm uh, approaching um, potential special guests and uh, ask them whether they want to do a seminar, they, first of all, they ask, how long should it be? And when you tell them an hour, they look like, ooh, an hour, that's a long time. In this case, Doc was like, oh, I can easily do three. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm sure he could. So, um, actually, I look forward to him doing that because um, he has great stories going back all the way to, um, well, let's say, um, Pantera, Baracora. Uh, that's the early uh, 80s. 
uh, we're talking about when he was working, still working at uh, at posters. At posters, yeah, right. So, yeah, and of I course, uh, he also did Attack from Mars, which is a game that a lot of people are uh, familiar with, and he even des- helped design the topper for the Attack from Mars remake. Right. Wow. Yeah. And of course, there'll be a, there'll be some other seminars taking place or talks or or I don't know. I, I heard heard story about a couple of guys I've never heard of them before who might be might be giving out some kind of prizes oh. as well. In I, I I don't know how that works. Those but, two uh, idiots. Yeah, I heard about yeah. them. Uh, they they always ruin the Texas Piston Pinball Festival. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but you're right, uh, but, but if you're if you're interested in uh, in in winning some some interesting free goodies. Um, then um, yeah um, those two idiots will be uh, presenting uh, I think they call it a quiz or something but the yeah. questions are so easy that yeah, anybody can win a prize exactly. you don't need yeah. to know anything because yeah. they don't know anything either so yeah. yeah so I don't know why they keep doing this but really well, somebody should tell them that they need to stop with that So I think they just must have a big storeroom full of, full of uh, pinball stuff they need to get rid of so Probably, yeah. yeah. So, uh, but I did hear they have some very cool um, um, uh, items from Jersey Jack Pinball um, uh, th- th- that they are going to give away. So maybe oh, wow. if, you're, if, if you're like, hey, I got these um, nice, uh, um, uh, I don't know what you call it, um, uh, display area and uh, that mm. could use some, some uh, cool uh, pinball, pinball play field. Um, yeah. um, what do you call it? Um, Translite or no uh, no no. He, he, um, uh, I think he provided a couple of uh, the miniature figures oh. that go on um, uh, oh, dialed wow. in. Okay. Oh right. Okay. So uh, be either Betty or the QED guy, yes. I suppose. Yes. Right. Oh right. wow. Oh there. That. Oh be great. and uh, and the gobstopper. The, the spinning one. Oh, well, don't 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 say too much because uh, wow. well, some of that some of that might not make it into the quiz. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> oh well. Yeah. Oh now well now we've got to give it away. Okay. Right. Right. So anyway. Yeah. So um, that's coming up um, not um, this weekend but next weekend in yes. uh, in Zwolle in uh, in the Netherlands yes. at the Dutch and Pinball Open. Expo. Right, okay. And of course, if it couldn't be more inconvenient, guess who's calling? Oh, really? Right at the end? Oh, well, I know. Uh, I spoke to him the other day, so we can't have a lot of extra news to, to impart. But uh, Oh, well, then let's forget about be, it. Uh, I mean, um, yeah, we, we've both seen him. Yeah. Okay. I, I don't I, suppose he's got earth shaking news, so sorry, people, but okay, we got Gary Flower calling in, as always, at the most inconvenient time ever. And um, since we're already running oh, for, yeah. I think, close to Fast two run. hours. Oh, my um, goodness. Yeah. This is crazy. Um, oh, we hung up anyway, so uh, oh. too bad. Sorry, that's Gary. That <laughs> that, that's one problem solved. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, um, I think at that point, then we better uh, call this uh, to a close and. Uh, and I think it does demonstrate exactly what an incredibly busy and and uh, newsworthy month October has been. Yes. Okay. So um, I'm expecting November will be uh, more of a quiet month now that uh, I think show season is sort of coming to a close. Um, Although we'll we'll certainly have some uh, some information from Houston to uh, to talk about. Yeah, and uh, of course from Florida as well. Um, but um, yeah, we'll see. Um, oh well, there's always stuff you don't see coming. So <laughs> make sure to tune in next month again for our uh, uh, Pimble News and Pimble Magazine uh, monthly Pimble Industry News Recap. Um, sign up for the uh, Pimble Magazine newsletter, which is free, by the way, and we don't spam you. We just send out one newsletter a month with a summary of um, uh, all the pinball news with illustrations or images and and what have you and links to uh, where you can see more um, and very very good it is too um, I, I certainly read it even though uh, and it always brings me uh, more information than, than I knew so I think it's definitely worthwhile um, signing up for that and I'd also recommend that you uh, 
if you haven't already, check out our coverage of uh, the Pinball Expo show on the uh, Pinball News site. Because, um, believe it or not, I've almost finished um, all five days. I'm just finishing off the, uh, the, the tournament coverage from Sunday. And then uh, everything will be done, and uh, and you can, as I said before, you can watch all thirty videos of uh, the seminars from uh, Pinball Expo 2019. Okay, Thanks. it will cost me another week, but I still yeah. have to go there because obviously well, I missed most of Expo, and even well, while thanks. I was there, I missed most of the seminars. <laughs> well, big thanks to Rob Burke for uh, for letting us uh, put all this online. So that's uh, that's that's a, a, no, a, a huge, great selling point for. Uh, Pinball Expo, of having all these these industry speakers right there on the doorstep, and as as you heard him say in, in the interview, and uh, to be able to put all those uh, online uh, in a way we were never able to do it before um, is uh, is a massive um, bonus. So thanks thanks Rob for that. Yeah, absolutely. So okay, without further ado, um, thanks for listening, and until next month. Yes, goodbye. Bye. <laughs>